didn't know that it was possible for a Cleveland team <laughs> to win something. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many old friends and teammates here uh, from the struggle against apartheid. Uh, my journey with George began when I read about him in the 1960s when he met with a group of black athletes who were prominent not only because they were great athletes, but, but because they were coming together to talk about boycotting the Mexico City Olympic Games and also to protest what was going on in South Africa. It was very meaningful and intense for me to see that. It made a huge impression on me. Uh, one of my dear friends growing up in New York City was then known as Lou Cinder, became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and I was very proud that Lou was one of those 11 people who got together that day with George Hauser. Uh, and I also took note, as somebody who was a young white guy who wanted to get involved in the civil rights movement, when I read about George Hauser, and realized that he was the only white person at that meeting, uh, that also had significance for me. My first impressions of George included being struck that a man who had done so many incredible things to change the course of history, from all of the things that have already been mentioned, from the Freedom Rides, the Founding Corps, to being involved with FOR, to going to prison, to helping to found the anti-apartheid movement and anti-colonial movements in this country, that he was so soft-spoken and so humble. Uh, here's the man who, from my point of view, was most responsible for awakening America to the injustices on the continent of Africa, who, as everybody will tell you, nobody would ever knew that he was doing those incredible things because he wouldn't talk about them. He would talk about his family or the Cleveland Browns or something else, but not about his own personal accomplishments. He helped lead the anti-colonial efforts in places like Ghana and the Congo and Kenya and Tanzania, the former French colonies, but it was South Africa, Rhodesia, Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Namibia, those countries held on to the oppression that they waved over the major majority of their populations, and the anti-apartheid movement became the core of the efforts in this country. I define a leader as somebody who stands up for justice and doesn't block its path, and I don't know anybody more than George Hauser who epitomized what that means. I approached George at some point about starting a boycott of, of sports. There was already a bank loan boycott, a trade boycott, an oil boycott, and a travel boycott. But the United States didn't really have any sports contacts with South Africa. South Africa was playing uh, Britain, New Zealand, Australia, some of the European countries. And as, the, as they began to be isolated in the mid-1970s, they had to turn to playing in the United States because those countries were no longer going to play against South Africa. So George was enthusiastic about starting the sports boycott. Uh, it immediately became uh, effective uh, with the first demonstrations that we had at Forest Hills in New York City uh, against the U.S. Tennis Association. Uh, I remember George and American Committee on Africa becoming the stalwarts in helping us as we founded Access uh, to do the sports boycott. Some of you know that in 1978, as a result of my being involved with the protest against the Davis Cup, uh, the South African team was playing in the North American zone in the Davis Cup that I was attacked in my office. I was teaching at a college in Virginia at the time. I had liver damage, kidney damage, a hernia, a concussion, had the N-word carved in my stomach. And it was a difficult time for me, and nobody was more supportive than George Hauser was to me at that particular point in my life. He was among the most principled people I have ever met. He was always firm and unwavering in his commitment to social justice for everyone, all groups included. I knew no better advocate for justice regarding the end of colonialism and apartheid than George Hauser, and of course you've heard that he also stood tall for civil rights in the United States 20 years before there was something called the Civil Rights Movement in the United States. I remember a conversation after the Davis Cup that I had with George Hauser in 1979. He said, I don't think I will ever live to see the day when Zimbabwe, Namibia, Mozambique, Angola, and South Africa will be free. Of course, two years later, they were all free, except for South Africa and Namibia. I will always remember standing by George's side on the steps of the Union buildings in Pretoria with many people who are here this, this morning at the inauguration of Nelson Mandela. It was a moment that I think we all realized that anything and everything is possible. That this man who had been a prisoner for 27 years could become the president of what had been the most racist system of government on the face of the earth in the second half of the 20th century, that all of the social justice issues that we talk about 
have a way that we can tackle them, have a resolution that those one small steps that we take, that George talked about, can be so important into the outcome. <coughs> After he retired from the American Committee, I always tried to see George whenever I came to New York, and George was a basketball fan, so we went to a lot of St. John's games together. Uh, my dad ended up being the coach at St. John's uh, for many years, and uh, so we always had good tickets to St. John's games, and George enjoyed having the good view of the game. Uh, the National Consortium for Academics and Sports, which Ethan mentioned, uh, I helped found that in 1985, and we honored Nelson Mandela in 2010. It was a period in Nelson Mandela's life that he was too frail to travel, so President Mandela asked George Hauser to represent him. President Mandela asked George Hauser to represent him. Gene and George flew from California, he was 95 at the time, to Orlando where the event was taking place. And in his, his acceptance speech, on behalf of President Mandela, he said wryly that people who supported apartheid and did not support equal rights considered him a troublemaker. And he called Nelson Mandela the master troublemaker of his lifetime. The DeVos Sports Business Management Program, which I chair, gave George its Hero Among Us Award. And my students were able to meet him and be inspired by him as I have been myself for the past 50 years. I felt blessed to be able to visit George and Jean in California four times over the past two years. Uh, even though he was battling age and declining health, he was always ready to talk about social justice. Because George Hauser understood that you don't have to be a woman to want to fight against sexism, you don't have to be African to want to fight against colonialism or apartheid, you don't have to be a person of color to want to fight against racism, you don't have to be gay or lesbian to want to fight against homophobia, you don't have to be poor to want to fight against poverty, and you don't have to be a person of color to want to fight against, not fight against racism. George stood tall on all those great issues. And one of the greatest honors of my life, and many of you were there, was at his 90th birthday party, Gene Hauser asked me to give the toast to George. And it was a gathering much like this, people from all over the country and all over the world, different races, different nationalities, different creeds. And I said, here's to George. He reminds me of a smooth stone that I used to take to ponds when I was young and skip it on the water. And as it bounced from place to place, it would create a circle. And those circles were all over the pond, but eventually they all came together into one circle. It's what George Hauser represented so brilliantly, bringing diverse groups of people together. George was like a tall candle whose bright light was quietly but powerfully spread to so many people around him, including myself and obviously so many people in this room. The world lost a giant and is a little less complete today, but the world is so much better because George Hauser graced this planet with his passion for social justice. Thank you very much. He had many connections and he worked at getting 
people connected. He had many, many organizations, and I'm not going to list them. But I will talk about tactics, because to get those organizations, you had to work. You had to do something. You had to think critically and get things accomplished. One tactic, I'll just illustrate with, goes with the story of who started CORE. Anybody want to answer the question in a way? Who started CORE? Some James Farmer. George Alton. Give me one more, by the way. Bernie, thank you. Okay. I'm glad we know that. But let me tell you the story of why we know that. Um, it is in 1992, there was a conference at Bluffton College on the origins of CORE and the Civil Rights Movement. And we mentioned August Meyer's book, which is very good. It does mention in there, however, a little bias toward George being the founder of, the founder of CORE. Uh, and it says so, kind of based on some documented work that letters or whatever that show George at a meeting where the main core came up with or whatever. This actually was a little bit of a problem, or frankly more than a little bit, because Jim Farmer and George Hauser loved each other. They absolutely admired each other, they had worked in the trenches together, and yet here was accidentally or whatever a moment of contention between the two how the historical legacy um, would be recorded. This actually came about because if you look at the, what most historians were doing, we're looking at the April 1942 National Council Minutes of the FOR, uh, which was the time that CORE was founded. But if you look at that, you see nothing about CORE. CORE was something that Jim had come up with this idea about, and A.J. Musty wasn't too wild about it, and George was interested in working on that, but he wasn't about to broadcast, you know, all his time being doing, doing this. They both were employees of FOR. The answer turned out to be in the October 1942 National Council meeting minutes, where Jim Farmer reports what he's been doing for the last six months. He says, well, I've been working in Chicago, uh, I've been working on CORE, which is the national version of George's Chicago project. And then George writes his report and says, well, I've been working on CORE, which is the Chicago version of Jim's national project. They're both giving each other credit. Actually, they're both trying to justify what they've been doing for six months on the FOR framework, starting this radical organization. It's a tactic that actually he repeated. And they repeated even in, on actions such as the journey of reconciliation, of getting other people to buy into something by removing yourself. It's humility. And it resonates here today with all of us, and I'm humbled to share part of documenting his legacy.